And I know he watches me. I Welcome to Westminster and to our inclusive family of faith. We extend a special welcome to visitors and those of us joining us on YouTube. Is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Let not your heart be troubled. His tender word I hear, and resting on his goodness, I lose my doubts and fears. Though by the path he leadeth, but one step I may see, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. And his eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. Good morning, friends. I love it when you guys do that. It's my favorite. So I know we're missing some of our friends today, but that's because summer is still happening, right? Next week, we're going to have backpack blessings. And do you know what you all need to bring for next Sunday? You were so right. It's a backpack, Rob. I'm so glad. <laughs> bring your backpack. And you know, if you're a teacher, bring your backpack. If you're a student, bring your backpack. If you're going to go to daycare, bring your backpack. Anybody can bring their backpack, even you, Rob. You should bring your backpack. Bring your backpack, Nina. We're going to have backpack blessings. But today, I wanted to give you something. Would it be okay? Okay, let's see. Hmm. Bert, I have a sticker for you. Okay, and I have a sticker for you. Oh, and Asher, here. You can have one, two, three, four. You can have four stickers. You know what? You have five stickers. Reed, you can have one sticker. Connor, you can have two stickers. Oh, Ben, Ben, I guess, Ben, you can have four. Audrey, you can have, you can have one, Audrey. Oh, Nova, you want a sticker? You can have two. Oh, and you can have one, and you have one. You can have three, and you can have four. Okay, so you have your stickers. Okay. You're all fair and equal. You all have stickers, right? I gave everybody stickers. Do you all, are you all good? Okay, Asher's great. He got five stickers. Oh, Rob, Rob only got one sticker. Are you okay? You got, you got, oh. So we are, we're all equal, right? We all got, you're all good? You're not good? Oh, and Ben got more than Audrey, yeah. Oh, you just cut to the end. Stop. Rob, come on. So, you all got stickers, but you didn't all get the same amount. Did that feel very fair? Okay, so what if, if everybody who got more, so Asher, Ben, everybody who got more, Nova, you're going to have to give me back your extra stickers. Does that make you feel better if I take stuff away from them? Well, that didn't make you feel, oh, that doesn't feel nice at all. Well, today in the Bible story, we are going to hear about Jesus telling us a parable. And it's about a man who owns a vineyard. A vineyard is full of grapes. And he hires workers. And he hires workers that come out first thing in the morning. And he says, will you work for me? And they said, yes. He said, okay, if you work for me all day long, I am going to pay you fairly. And they said, great. 
Well, then at lunchtime, he hired some more workers. And at the end of the day, he said, I will pay you fairly. They said, great. Well, then right before it was time to get home, he hired a few more workers to help him in the vineyard. And he said, will you work for me? They said, yes. And he said, I will pay you fairly. So at the end of the day, they all got done working in the vineyard and they came to the employer. And he said, thank you for working in my vineyard. Here you go. You all get the exact same amount of money. Do you know what the people who started working the very first thing in the morning said? That's not fair. What about those people that only came at lunchtime? And what about those people who only came here 30 minutes ago? Yeah. I worked all day long and I got paid the same amount of money as the people who came five minutes ago. Is that make them, is that fair? So should, the, should he have taken the money back from the other people? Hmm. Why do you think, Asher, if you thought, why do you think Jesus told this parable? It's okay if you don't. Okay. So he taught this parable to say, if we focus on what everybody else has, if you look at who scores more soccer goals than you, or who got to kick the ball more than you, or maybe who got more dance solos than you, or who was asked to join a football team, or maybe who got invited to more sleepovers, man, you're going to not really get to focus on what you do have, are you? Can you focus on what you do have? You did get paid a fair wage. He did say what he would do, and you agreed to it. Those workers were given something, but instead of being happy for what they had, they looked at their neighbors and they were jealous. This year, when you go back to school and you're doing different things, it's gonna be really easy, even for us as adults. You know, sometimes we look at the people next to us and we think, Rob's got a really much nicer car than I do. Yours isn't full of goldfish crumbs or soccer cleats. And, but then I remember that I do have a car and I do get to drive and I do get to be safely to go pick up my kids. Is it really easy to look at your neighbor next to you and maybe think they have a nicer backpack than you when you go back to school? Yeah, or maybe that they ran a faster time than you. You know, it's, it happens to all of us, guys. But what Jesus is telling us right here is, can we focus on what we do have? Yes, yes Nova. <laughs> hey, and Nova, with that, you want to pray with me? Okay. Dear God, thank you for my blessings. Thank you for my friend's blessings. Thank you for providing what I need. Let me have a grateful heart and a happy heart. Amen. Close Holy Spirit, as the scriptures are read and the word is proclaimed, let the word of faith be on our lips and in our hearts and let all other words slip away. May there be one voice we hear today, the voice of truth and grace. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is Psalms 139, verses 1 through 12. You have looked deep into my heart, Lord, and you know all about me. You know when I am resting or when I am working, and from heaven you discover my thoughts. You notice everything I do and everywhere I go. Before I even speak a word, you know what I will say. And with your powerful arm, you protect me from every side. I can't understand all this. Such wonderful knowledge is far above me. Where could I go to escape from your spirit or from your sight? If I were to climb up to the highest heaven, you would be there. If I were to dig down to the word of the dead, you would also be there. Suppose I had wings like the dawning day and flew across the ocean. Even then, your powerful arm would guide and protect me. Or suppose I said, I'll hide in the dark until night comes to cover me over. But you see in the dark, because daylight and dark are all the same to you. 
The word of the Lord. Gospel lesson this morning comes from the gospel according, uh, according to Matthew chapter 20 verses 1 through 16. Listen for the word of God. As Jesus was telling what the kingdom of heaven would be like, he said, early one morning a man went out to hire some workers for his vineyard. After he had agreed to pay them the usual wage for a day's work, he sent them off to his vineyard. About nine that morning, the man saw some other people standing in the market with nothing to do. He promised to pay them what was fair if they would go and work in his vineyard. So they went. At noon and again at about three in the afternoon, he returned to the market, and each time he made the same agreement with others who were loaf loafing around with nothing to do. And finally, at about five in the afternoon, the man went back and found some others standing there, and he asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. Then he told them to go work in his vineyard. That evening, the owner of the vineyard told the man in charge of the workers to call them in and give them their money. He also told the man to begin with the ones who were hired last. When the workers arrived, the ones who had been hired at five in the afternoon were given a full day's pay. The workers who had been hired first thought they would be given more than the others, but when they were given the same, they began complaining to the owner of the vineyard. They said, the ones who were hired last worked for only one hour, but you paid them the same that you did us, and we worked in the hot sun all day long. The owner answered one of them, friend, I didn't cheat you. I paid you exactly what we agreed on. Take your money now and go. What business is it of yours if I want to pay them the same that I paid you? Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? 
Why should you be jealous if I want to be generous? Then Jesus said, so it is. Everyone who is now last will be first, and everyone who is first will be last. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's a privilege and an honor to be able to worship with you today. There's a thing, uh, this is the first time I've ever stood in this pulpit, the first time ever, I've ever preached here, and there's a thing that I always feel compelled to do when I do this for the first time. There's a story that I will tell you. I, uh, I'm John Williams. I'm the chaplain at Austin College up in Sherman. I began my 31st year working for Austin College last week. But before then, I was a parish associate at North Park Presbyterian Church in Dallas. And I, I, that's where I went straight out of seminary. I graduated from Austin Seminary in 1987. And early on, while I was doing that work in Dallas, one of the things I got to do as a fresh young seminary graduate was to go over to Presbyterian Village North, you know, the retirement facility that's over in North Dallas, and preach at worship services there on Sunday nights. It was really good experience for a young pastor like me to write sermons, to put worship services together and all of that. And, you know, the worship service at Presbyterian Village looks a whole lot like this service in a lot of ways. I mean, it's a good Presbyterian service. You do the service, you preach, you walk to the back, and at the end, everybody walks back and smiles and tell you what a good job they did. What, I'm sorry, what a good job you did. Uh, the, so that, that process happens at Presbyterian Village North. It just takes a little longer than it does here. So when I was a young, a green, young, fresh out of seminary preacher, I was over there one Sunday night, and they were walking out, and this little old lady who wasn't five feet tall looked up at me, and she said, I believe you're the best preacher we've ever had here. Well, I, I didn't mind hearing that, as you might imagine, but that's not all she said. She looked up, and she said, it was so short, and you were so loud. So I, I just, I feel compelled to let y'all know when we begin that I'm aware of what my gifts are uh, in the pulpit. Well, it's time now. I, I, we had another wonderful church school session this morning. I was also able to lead a session down here in June. And we're going to do, this is a sermon that's related to today's lesson. And I'm going to tell you now. I told you already that I'm loud and uh, it's not all that long. The other thing I'm going to tell you is today, right now, you're going to need to buckle up because we're about to go jumping all over the Bible, okay? So just get ready. First, before we talk about the Bible per se, I'm going to ask you some questions that I don't think I've ever asked from a pulpit before in my 35 years of ordained ministry. Question number one, do you have relationships with people who are not Christians? It's 2023 in America. I bet most of us do. About a third of our students at Austin College don't identify as Christians, and neither do many of our professors. More questions for you. Do you believe God loves those people? Do you believe those people will all go to hell unless they become Christians before they die? Do you believe our only relationships with people outside the church should involve in trying to convince all of them to become Christians like us? Sorry, those are kind of meddlesome questions. Over the centuries and into the present day, that has been the predominant attitude of many Christians toward people outside the church. At least on paper, Christians through the centuries have said, you got to be Christian if you want to be right with God. And Christians who have that position have not made that up out of thin air. John 3.16 absolutely says, For God so loved the world that God gave His only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him may not perish but may have eternal life. And in John 14.6, Jesus does say, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. In the Great Commission in Matthew 28.19 and 20, Jesus says, Go to the, the, to the people of all nations and make them my disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to do everything that I have told you. I will be with you always, even to the end of the world. Those are familiar passages to most of us, and if those were the only passages in the Bible about how Christians like us are to think about persons beyond our particular faith community, then I guess that would be that. But the Bible includes other ideas and other stories 
that we should take seriously as we think about how to live together faithfully and lovingly in the diverse world where we woke up this morning. This morning's passage from Matthew's Gospel is one of those stories. In the contemporary English version that I just read to you, Matthew begins the story in chapter 20, verse 1, by telling us that Jesus told this story as he was telling disciples what the kingdom of heaven would be like. So we know from the get-go, before we start looking at all the details about laborers and vineyards and all that stuff, we know from the start that this is a story about heaven. And you remember what happens. This guy goes out early one morning to hire some laborers for his vineyard. He hires some workers. Apparently, he hires all the ones who were there that early and agrees to pay them all the usual daily wage and sends them off into his vineyard. He comes back later in the morning, sees some more people standing around looking for work, hires them, agrees to pay them the usual daily wage, and sends them off to work in his vineyard. This happens again at about 3 o'clock and again at about 5 o'clock the same day, and then in the evening, the landowner tells his manager, to settle up with the workers and give them their pay. All the laborers are gathered together now, and the manager first pays the ones hired at 5 p.m., and they get a whole day's pay. Matthew tells us that when they saw that, the ones hired at dawn were expecting to get more, but they didn't. They got the same pay as the ones hired at 5 o'clock, and they complained to the owner. In verse 12, they say, the ones who were hired last worked for only one hour but you paid them the same as you did us and we worked in the hot sun all day long and again we need to remember that this is a parable about heaven as we consider the owner's response in verse 13 friend I didn't cheat you I paid you exactly what we agreed on take your money now and go what business is it of yours if I want to pay them the same that I paid you don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Why should you be jealous if I want to be generous? Why should you be jealous if I want to be generous? I think that's a very interesting question for a parable about heaven. I think Jesus might be telling us here that we shouldn't be too certain about who else is going to be there when we get to heaven. And the landowner's question made me think about Jonah. Y'all remember how the book of Jonah ends? A lot of us have read the whole book of Jonah during church school today. Uh, the rest of you, I'll clue you in. You, for, you Don't worry about the big fish. The primary lesson of the book of Jonah is in God chastising Jonah in chapter 4 because Jonah gets mad at God for deciding to spare those infidel Ninevites. Remember the story God first calls Jonah and tells him to go preach in Nineveh. Jonah doesn't want to do that. He doesn't want to go preach to a bunch of infidel foreigners, and so he hops on a boat and runs away. God sends a storm. Jonah gets thrown overboard. He gets saved by the big fish and then deposited back on dry ground. That dry ground. God calls him again to go to Nineveh. This time, Jonah, who still smells like fish guts, decides he should probably go where God sends him. So he goes to Nineveh, he get, Nineveh, he gets there and he starts preaching to all those infidel foreigners. And it works. The Ninevites say, oh snap, we'd better straighten up and fly right. God hears their repentance and decides not to destroy the Ninevites. And God's decision not to destroy the Ninevites is what makes Jonah mad. Jonah is mad at God in chapter 4 because God is nice to the infidel foreigners. He goes traipsing up a hill with the hopes that he's going to get to see God wipe out all those people who are not like him. He sits down on that hill outside town hoping that God is going to relent and decide to destroy the Ninevites after all. It's hot. God sends a vine to grow up over Jonah to give him shade. Jonah likes that. Then God sends a worm to destroy the vine, and after the worm comes, Jonah pitches a fit. And then in Jonah chapter 4, verses 10 and 11, God says to Jonah, You are concerned about a vine that you did not plant or take care of, a vine that grew up in one night and died the next night. In that great city of Nineveh, there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell right from wrong, and there are also many cattle there. I'm not sure why that's in the story, but it comes up. And God says, Jonah, don't you think I ought to be concerned about that whole big city? 
That's essentially God telling Jonah, get over yourself, fish food. You sure got a lot of nerve complaining when I'm as nice to people who aren't like you as I am to you. To me, that sounds a lot like the landowner in Matthew 20. Why should you be jealous if I am generous? The lesson of both these biblical stories is that God's mercy and concern are not limited to people that Jonah or the workers hired at dawn or we like or approve of. One of the great blessings of my life is that I grew up in Fort Worth in the same city where all four of my grandparents lived. I was the first grandchild on my mother's side and I saw my maternal grandparents regularly. I called them Mama and Granddaddy. I was the first one, so apparently that's who they were. Then when I was three, my younger brother Matthew was born. He was a cute little scamp, and everybody loved him, including me most of the time. As he got a little older and learned to talk, Matthew started calling our grandmother Honey. That makes sense. It's what she often called him, so it made sense for him to call her honey in response to her calling him honey. And he began calling our grandfather Peepi. My granddaddy was a cowboy from West Texas, and that was his version of the peekaboo game. You know, he called that game Peepi. It's the game that grandfathers have been pay playing with grandchildren for eons. But that development... This young upstart brother at my house calling our grandparents by different names hung me up. My little brother didn't use the right language. He didn't call our grandparents the right names. Everybody knew that was Mama and Granddaddy. But even though Matthew and I had very similar experiences of consistent and unconditional love in our interactions with our grandparents, we used a different language to relate and respond to them. I get invited to tell that particular story every year at the Austin College Muslim Students Association Interfaith Dialogue Dinner. Somehow, the recognition that different people use different words to articulate their response to conditional and, I'm sorry, to unconditional and consistent love, the idea that different persons different people use different language to talk about that love seems relevant in the context of an interfaith dialogue. My experience with Matthew and with hundreds of Austin College students and colleagues has led me, has led me not to reject the ways that other people articulate their understanding of unconditional love just because they don't use language that is familiar to me. Let's look back at the words of Psalm 139 that we heard earlier. That's a beautiful, famous, and profound psalm. You have looked deep into my heart, Lord, and you know all about me. You know when I am resting or when I am working. From heaven you discover my thoughts. You notice everything I do and everywhere I go. Before I even speak a word, you know what I will say, and with your powerful arm you protect me from every side. Here's the thing about Psalm 139. Even though I did not write Psalm 139, I believe that what the psalmist says about God, you know, look deep into my heart, knows all about me, knows when I'm resting or working, notices everything I do and everywhere I go will protect me from every side. What that psalmist says about God is also true about God's relationship to me. I believe all those things are as true about me as they are about the person who wrote that psalm. I also believe that all those things about God in Psalm 139 are true about God's relationship with you. Verse 6, I can't understand all of this. Such wonder, wonderful knowledge is far above me. There is nothing in that whole psalm about the complete, sufficient, and dependable love of God that suggests that there are any limits to that love of God. Verse 7, where could I go to escape from your spirit? Or from your sight. If I were to climb up to the highest heavens, you would be there. If I were to dig down to the world of the dead, you would also be there. That's the psalmist saying, and again, saying something that's also true about me and about you. Wherever I am, before or after I die, I will never be anywhere where God isn't, never be anywhere where God can't reach me. 
It's true about me. It's true about you. And according to this psalm, neither will anybody else be beyond God's reach, whether they're even Christian or not. The very first covenant mentioned in the Bible comes when God is talking to Noah after the great flood. In Genesis 9, 16, God tells Noah, when I see the rainbow in the sky, I will always remember the promise that I have made to, to every living creature. The rainbow will be a sign of that solemn promise. According to our Bible, God's oldest covenant is with every living creature. That certainly includes me and you and every Christian, but we need to be careful about assuming that we're the only ones that God cares about. We're not the only ones that God thinks about when God sees a rainbow. Micah chapter 6 verse 8, God says, it says, God has told the Lord what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Friends, as we consider how to live out authentic Christian faith in a multi-faith context, I think Presbyterians like us will do well to follow the guidance of Micah and walk humbly with God. I think walking humbly means letting God be God. Walking humbly means trying hard not to be jealous because God is generous. Walking humbly means remembering God's promise to notice, accompany, and protect every living creature. I think it means we shouldn't spend much time worrying about who's in and who's out. Let's spend our time and energy instead seeking to be instruments of God's gracious, merciful, patient, and abundant love whenever, wherever, and for whomever we can. That's what we're called to do. That's who we're called to be. That's why we get together. That's what, we're, that's what we're led to be as the body of Christ in the world. Amen.